The first time I met Mr. Talent was in the late summer of 1906 in a small, lonely inn on the top of a mountain. For natives, rainy days in these places are not very different from other days. But for the tourist, rainy days are boring. I had been bored for a week and was thinking of returning to London when Mr. Talent came. And because I could not place Mr. Talent, nor elucidate him to my satisfaction, he intrigued me, for a barrister should be able to sum up men in a few minutes. I did not see Mr. Talent arrive, nor did I observe him entering the room. I looked up, and he was there, in the small firelit parlour. He was reading a manuscript, slightly moving his lips as he read. He was a gentle, moth-like man, very lean and about six foot three or more. He had neutral colored hair and eyes, a nondescript suit, limp looking hands, and slightly turned up toes. The most noticeable thing about him was an expression of passive and enduring obstinacy. I wished him good evening and asked if he had a paper. No, he said softly. No, only a little manuscript of my own. Now, as a rule, I am as wary of manuscripts as a hare is of greyhounds. Having once been a critic, I am always liable to receive parcels of these for advice. But the day had been so dull, and I had nothing else to read. May I have the privilege? I queried, knowing he intended me to have it. How kind! He exclaimed. A stranger, knowing nothing of my hopes and aims, yet willing to undertake so onerous a task? <laughs> Not at all, I replied, with a nervous chuckle. I think, he murmured, drawing near and, as it were, taking possession of me, looming above me with his great height, it might be best for me to read it to you. I am considered to have rather a fine reading voice. Then he read, I wish I could describe to you that slow, expressionless, unstoppable voice. It was a voice for which at the time I could find no comparison. Now I know that it was like the voice of the loudspeaker in a dull subject. At first one listened. I took in all the first six chapters, which were unbelievably dull. I got all the scenery, characters, undramatic events clearly marshaled. I imagined that something would happen. I thought the characters were going to develop, do fearful things or great and holy deeds. But they did nothing. The book was flat, formless. He always said what one expected him to say. His slow, monotonous voice went on without a pause, with the terrible tirelessness of a gramophone. I tried to think of other things, but he read too distinctly for that. I could neither listen to him nor ignore him. I have never spent such an evening. The hours dragged on. At last, I weakly murmured, um, Could we have a pause just for a few minutes? For, uh, for discussion? Not, he replied, at the most exciting moment. Don't you realize that now I have worked up my plot to the most dramatic moment? All the characters are waiting Attention for the tragedy. He went on reading. I went on awaiting the tragedy. But there was no tragedy. My head ached abominably. I found myself thinking quite solemnly. If the maidservant doesn't bring supper soon, I shall kill him. Suddenly the reading stopped. She is bringing supper, he said. Now we can have a little discussion. Afterwards, I will finish the manuscript. He did, and after that he told me all about his will. He said he was leaving all his money for the posthumous publication of his manuscripts. He also said that he would like me to draw this up for him, and to be the trustee of the manuscripts. I said I was too busy. He replied that I could draw up the will tomorrow. After that you need to do no more. You can pay a critic to read the manuscripts. You can pay a publisher to publish them, and I in them shall be remembered. He added that if I still had doubts as to their literary worth, he would read me another. I gave in. 
Would anyone else have done differently? I drew up the will, left an address where he could send his stuff, and left the inn.